Hi, and welcome to this installment of the Orthopedic Video Lecture Series. This talk is on preoperative planning. Preop planning has many benefits. For me, it establishes a framework for the operation, from setup to execution to completion, so that the operation can become a sort of second nature. In a sense, by writing a pre-op plan, you're freeing up server time to be really present to the operative experience and ready for those moment-to-moment -moment changes. There's no doubt that a pre-op plan saves time. In the pre-anesthesia days, you wanted a fast surgeon. However, people under general or spinal anesthetic, even now, time still matters. Inefficient use of OR time has definite downside effects, ranging from cost to tourniquet time to even just less time to accomplish other operations. A pre-op plan will avoid some costly mistakes. What you might take for granted in a busy academic center is that we usually have all the tools and equipment readily available. However, you don't want to put yourself in a setting where you go to do a simple hardware removal, only to, only to discover that the key tool to remove the implant doesn't live at your facility. In the big picture, it just makes you a better surgeon. Let's talk about some myths. First of all, it takes too much time. A pre-op plan can be done as little as 10 minutes. Ideally, a good plan should be done a day or more in advance, but we don't always have that luxury. From the time that you see the patient in holding or on the floor and the moment that the patient is asleep, you can work out your pre-op plan, and this talk will hope to show you a method. It's not worth my time. The attending will do something different. While some, if not many, of the particulars might be different from a residence plan to the attending's plan, many things won't be. The development of a pre-op plan will increase your ownership in the case and will also lead to some good questions for discussion, comparison, and contrast when the opportunities arise during the case. Organizing and saving the files of your plans will also benefit you down the road when you might need to recall the finer points of the operation when you start taking call in practice. Once I've done a few nails, ankles, both bone forearm fractures, it's all the same, correct? Well, rep repetition is the key to adult learning, and the process of pre-op planning is essential, maybe even more so for the routine cases. Total joint surgeons always plan for their cases, and it just makes good practice. In other disciplines, like flying, good pilots always have a detailed flight plan, and at the highest levels, precision flying teams like the Navy Blue Angels go through every maneuver of the show beforehand, even if they've done the same thing hundreds of times before. And this is how I like to think about the pre-op plan, and it has more often than not yielded valuable insight and changed my plan of action on many occasions. I'll do it later. It's never too early to get in the habit of having good habits. Of course, these aren't your cases, but if you draw up a pre-op plan for every case now, it will become second nature and something that will reduce even the most complex cases into a series of steps. It is, a, it is an investment in your ability to do your greatest work, even if that something is entirely different from orthopedic trauma. So what's the anatomy of a pre-op plan? Every plan should include room setup, instruments, patient positioning, exposure, reduction, and fixation. Room setup. What type of personnel will be there to help you? If the person is large, ask for more help. In some settings, it might be just you and a scrub, so you'll definitely want to draw up a plan that reflects this. Will you need a radiolucent bed or a fracture table? Which side will you bring in the fluoro? And does everybody have access or need lead aprons? Do you need to ask for a headlamp? On cases with expected high blood loss, you might want to ask for a cell saver. Instruments. Will you need traction and will it require a special table? Particular approaches call for special retractors or in obese patients, you might need larger retractors. For reduction, tools like the collinear clamp might be helpful. I find point-to-point -point and modified spin-down clamps to be more helpful than the clamps that come standard in the set. Of course, your plan will include implants to use. You'll also want to think about and prepare for any special devices needed to remove existing hardware. A bent nail or screw might require, might require a metal cutting burr or the broken screw removal set that don't always, aren't always readily available. Patient positioning. This can be an additional challenge in multiple trauma, and you might only be able to prep and drape one or two extremities. 
this makes it a situation where you have to prioritize which injuries you'll address first. This is also where I'll plan to get images of the well, foot, leg, or extremity for comparison. Imaging might change once the patient is bumped up to one side or the other. And it's a good idea to plan your imaging before you prep and drape to make certain that you can see what you need to see before the exposure is made. Bolsters or bone foam might also be helpful. Exposure. Notice how many things we've already controlled just by thinking about room setup, instruments, and patient positioning. Carefully plan your skin incision to see and avoid important structures and give adequate exposure for reduction and placement of implants. This might have to factor in previous scars or wounds. Superficial and deep dissection is driven by the particular approach and injury that you're performing. Will you need a tenotomy or osteotomy? And if so, do you need to tag or pre-drill for later repair? Plan to expose only as much as you need to reduce the fracture. The periosteum will already be stripped at the fracture site, so your job is to limit the damage done by a careless approach that devitalizes more bone than necessary. Reduction. How will you achieve this? By now, you've already likely accomplished some of this by establishing on-table traction or the right personnel to manage the traction while you reduce the fracture. Or your plan might include the use of a femoral distractor. This plan will have benefit in that your scrub will already have the distractor set up. How will you place your clamps and in which vector should be included in the plan? And will you need K-wires to provisionally hold or use as joysticks to reduce the fracture? Fixation. Will you need to place a lag screw in what size? Will you countersink? Obviously, your plan should include the type of plate, the ideal position on the bone, and how you'll provisionally hold it before you place your definitive fixation. The type of soft tissue repair needed is necessary because you might want to mark structures such as the retinaculum, the fascia, or the pes for later repair when you close. After gathering all your relevant information, your history, physical exam, and radiographs, it's time to start your pre-op planning. In this case example, I'll go through the steps for the method I use to do my plan. This is a case of a 63-year-old presenting to your emergency room after a fall from the ladder. She is nerve-ashly intact and has moderate swelling. You splint her and plan to bring her back in a week to 10 days for the definitive repair of her combined ankle and talus fracture. For many fractures, I like to get advanced imaging, and I start with the plain films working my way up through the CT scans, printing the most relevant images. These images are also helpful in discussing the nature of the injury and your operative plan with your patient before surgery. On particularly complex cases, I like to render a 3D reconstruction, and I'll print this and make my notes on that piece of paper. Room setup. In this case, it was clear that we would go supine, we would bring the C-arm from the opposite side to get images of the uninjured extremity before prepping and draping. We would get the contralateral views and use bone foam to elevate the injured extremity for better lateral views. My list of tools and implants included ephemeral distractor, K-wires, 3.5 and 2.7 millimeter screws, and small plates. For the exposure, I like to draw a skin incision on the plan, and in this case, I plan both medial and lateral exposures. The exposure should also include if there is a need to clean the fracture or debride the subtalar joint, which was necessary in this case. You can see here the benefit of just applying traction through the use of a femoral distractor. So the next step in reduction really is straightforward in terms of where to place K-wires medially and laterally. Sometimes for small, frag for small fragments, you might need to gain control with the use of threaded wires, which aren't always readily available. The order of the reduction is established. In this case, the medial read was better, and therefore I plan to do a medial reduction first and the, then proceed to the lateral side, which is not typical for a Taylor neck fracture. The next step was to reduce and hold the lateral process fracture and then the lateral aspect of the Taylor neck. 
Now that we've reduced the fracture, this is actually the most straightforward part of the plan. In terms of fixation, you should allow to place provisional fixation in a zone where you don't interfere with the play placement of the definitive fixation and thus avoid the traffic. The plan has allowed me now to have everything that I need available and ready to go at that point of the operation that requires it. In this case, I also plan to evaluate and make certain the talonavicular and the calcaneocuboid joints were well reduced and not need a further intention, attention as it had been on my pre-op imaging. So this is an example of the final product. This case was able to be completed with skin closed in just at two hours of tourniquet time. And that's not something I could have done without a plan. In summary, a written pre-op plan is essential to the performance of high quality surgery. The plan should include a detailed and stepwise approach to the operative experience that begins with room setup and ends with fixation and closure. A good pre-op plan will make you and everyone on your team more efficient. And lastly, a preoperative plan is the foundation of excellence in surgery, not only the complex cases, but the routine cases as well. Thank you for your time and attention.